So, welcome back. We have started looking at rule based systems. We started by saying that they were originally developed as rule based expert systems, but then we said that it is not necessarily going to be an expert system, but it is going to be a useful system nevertheless. And so, let us look at the mechanism which we use for building rule based systems. So, the knowledge base in a rule based expert system of the kind that we are describing or rule based system that we are describing is called the working memory. So, it represents a current state, contains a set of records or statements known as working memory elements, WMEs as we will call them. And the working memory is the model of the short term memory of the problem solvers. It is the data that the problem solver is working on essentially. It is not problem solving knowledge, it is the data and therefore, we can think of that as short term memory. Then it has a set of rules or productions. Each rule or each production represents a move or a decision or a action, conditional action. It has a name or an identifier. So, every rule will have a name, has one or more patterns on the left hand side of the rule and has one or more actions on the right hand side of the rule essentially. So, it is going to be left hand side. If the left hand side matches, then the right hand side whatever it says has to be done. And we can think of this as a long term memory of a problem solver because it encapsulates the problem solving knowledge that the problem solver has as opposed to the problem solving instance that the problem solver is trying to solve that is in the working memory. Whereas, rules capture the knowledge that the agent has. So, we need an inference engine that is the third component. Uh, an inference engine is a program that matches patterns in all the rules with all the working memory elements. So, at any given point this is what it would do. It look at the set of all rules, look at the set of all working memory elements and say which ones match essentially. Then from the ones that match, it will have to somehow pick one matching rule and execute it or fire is as we say uh, the actions in that rule essentially. So, once it does that, it may change the working memory or it may trigger some action outside or it may even terminate the program, uh, whatever the action is. Uh, but then once the action is done, it goes back and again goes and matches all the rules with all the data and uh, chooses the next action. So, that is what the inference engine does. It does a cycle of match, resolve and execute as we will describe. So, here it is the match, the resolve and the execute cycle and it just repeatedly does that essentially. So, first let us look at the match. What does match do? It uh, takes as input the working memory and the set of rules that are given to it and it generates a set which we will call as a conflict set. So, it is called a conflict set because it is all the set of matching rules and you know there is a conflict as to which one to execute. So, the match algorithm takes a set of rules and the set of working memory elements and generates the conflict set. Each element in the conflict set is a rule, rule name along with identities of matching element, working memory elements. As to the same rule may match with different working memory elements. So, it will find different instances in the conflict set. The conflict to be resolved is which rule to select from the set of matching rules. So, the first part only does the match, it produces a conflict set and the conflict set says these are the possible rules that you can execute or fire is a term that we often use. The second part is resolve. Resolve simply selects one of the rules and it depends upon what is the conflict resolution strategy that you are going to be working with. We will look at a couple of strategies as we go along. So, the resolve component knows about the conflict resolution strategies. The third part is execute. So, by the time you have done match and resolve, you have one rule along with the data that it matches. And then you take that rule, go to the actions on the right hand side and execute them. Most of the time the actions would say, okay, add this new working memory element or things like that. 
and it goes and changes that. So, the working memory changes. As we will see, it also can delete working memory elements, which takes us beyond the realm of classical logic, uh, but it can do that. So, you can add working memory elements or you can delete working memory elements and then of course, you have to go back and match all over again. So, the language that I am going to talk about is a language called OPS5, OPS5. OPS5 plus also there was a version which I had worked with uh, when I was doing my PhD and it is a production system language actually. Originated in CMU in the late 70s, it was devised by Charles Forgy who was doing his PhD in CMU. The OPS stands for official production system language which you can take with a little bit of a pinch of salt. It was the first rule based language uh, which was more than just a reasoning algorithm. It graduated into being a declarative programming language essentially and as we said it is a Turing complete language. The form of a rule in OPS5 is that you give the name of the production which is P which is followed by which, which follows P. So, P says this is a production and then you give the name then you describe the left hand side and the right hand side. The idea of expert systems as we said was that programs with knowledge required from domain experts and the knowledge was expressed in the form of rules essentially. So, we had seen uh, we had mentioned this system called R1, maybe I will show you that slide again this thing, which was used for configuring uh, deck wax computer systems. So, what is the syntax for the working memory? The data structure that we use here is a structured record. You start with a class name with a set of attributes and attributes are marked by this hat symbol and they are followed by values. So, the data is essentially a set of attribute value pairs. The record is a set of attribute value pairs and the data is a set of records. It is interesting to note that the order of writing the attributes is not important. Uh, you can do write them in any order. And that is possible because of the algorithm that we are going to study, which did not consider, which did not kind of scan the rule from left to right or something like that. Essentially. Hmm. So, you could put the attributes in any order and it would still work. And by, de by definition, the default value of an attribute is nil. If you do not specify the value of an attribute, then it is nil. So, here is an example of a working memory element. Uh, the name of the class or the class name is student, the attributes are name, age, semester, discipline. The values of the attributes are name is Sudhir, age is 19, semester is 3, discipline is maths and the degree that Sudhir is studying for is MSc. So, we have 5 attributes and their 5 values and this would be a working memory element and the working memory would be a collection of such working memory elements. Of course, this is not the only class name that you can use, you can have other kind of data. Teacher, you can have course description, you can have slots, you can have all kinds of stuff. Now, if you look at first order logic, it is a collection of sentences. So, for example, this record that we have about the student could be seen as a collection of five independent sentences. So, the sentences could be that the name of the student is Sudhir. So, I would write it for example, if I was using equality something like this, let us call him student 1. So, in first order logic with equality, I could write the first attribute value pair as a sentence. Then I could say the age of student number 1 is 19 and then the semester that student number 1 is studying is third. There is a discipline that the student number 1 is studying is uh, math. and the degree that student number 1 is studying for is MSc essentially. 
So these are five different sentences. They may be floating around in your sea of sentences, and it is the task of the uh, power chaining. It's a it's a task of the theorem prover to you know collect them together if if they are going to be part of a rule. So if if we had a rule which said that if there is a student whose name uh, whose age is uh, uh, between eighteen and twenty, and who is not finished his semester uh, one. Then you know maybe you send a note to him or something like that. Uh, then of course it would have to match those different components. What we will see is that for many tasks, uh, it is there is a strong case that one can make for organizing sentences into structures essentially. So we put the whole thing together. So in some sense, it's physically together in one place. It is stored there essentially. And therefore, it is easy to access. The program doesn't have to search. So remember that the prolog program would have to search for every predicate down the line, essentially. If you store them as structures, then of course you don't have to do that. And that has a lot to say for this. We will look at uh, the idea of frames a little bit later, which kind of organizes knowledge into into such structures. And the notion of frames was given to us by Marvin Minsky, who was in MIT. And it led to this idea of object-oriented uh, systems, which are very popular now. So the whole idea is to keep relevant facts together in some kind of a package, so that they are accessible as a whole. Essentially, hmm. we will look at this idea a little bit later. So the working memory is the short-term memory, as we said, and this was the idea put forward by Simon and Newell, who were at CMU. Uh, and it contains the data the solver is currently working on essentially. The working memory is a collection of working memory elements. We already said that. The working memory elements are indexed by a timestamp. So this timestamp is going to be useful as we see because one of the conflict resolution strategies that we will use will require to look at the timestamp. So we will say that this is the first working memory element, this is the second working memory element and so on. So time is going to go discreetly from 1 onwards, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, hmm. indicating the order in which they were added to the working memory. So here is an example of a working memory element or the working memory which has a set of working memory elements. So we have the timestamp on the left, then you have the class name. Then you have the attribute name for each work in inside each WME and the value of the attribute in for, for every attribute essentially. So we have a collection of such records and that forms the working memory. So here we have some record, um, whatever they mean, essentially so total marks of student uh, whose name is Sangeeta. We have not said whose name is Sangeeta, we have just put Sangeeta as the value of student. Marks is 97 and rank nil means it's not yet been assigned. So maybe you are writing a program to assign ranks. Or if you are working with a array of numbers, we might say array index 1 is 29, array index 2 is 12 and so on. So we have talked about working memory elements, we have talked about working memory. Let's talk about rules now. The left hand side of a rule is a set of patterns that conform to the syntax of the working memory elements. It means that the rule will have a pattern and the pattern will have the same class name as the working memory, some element that it is intended to match and the same attribute names essentially. The value in patterns in the rule can have variables essentially or it can even have Boolean tests essentially. So instead of saying that the number is 19, I may say as long as the number is greater than 15, you match that essentially. Hmm. So we will see examples. There may be even negative patterns we will see that this is kind of changing things a little bit. A negative pattern is a pattern which should not exist in the knowledge base or in the working memory. So for example, if the next rank to be assigned is R, so let us say we are doing this ranking uh, uh, problem that I had kind of mentioned. Uh, one thing that OPS5 uses is the notion of a variable and as indicated here, variable is put in angular brackets. So anything in angular brackets in a rule is a variable. Variables do not exist in uh, working memory essentially. Working memory is opposed, uh, supposed to be propositional in nature which means it does not have variables. So the rule that you might want to write is the following. 
that if the next rank to be assigned is R and there is no student with marks M and rank nil and there is a student with marks M and rank nil and there is no student with higher marks and rank nil which means if you can see a student who has got some let us say 79 marks or something like that, that M will match anything as we will see and who has not been given a rank and there is no student in the working memory element who has got higher than M marks, which means higher than 79 marks, then you can assign this rank to that student essentially. So, that is the nature of rules that we will be working with. So, this rule if we call it ranking rule says here in so, as you can see the pattern one says the next rank is R. It is a pattern because it conforms to the class name R who has an attribute called rank which may have something inside, but we are saying we do not care. It is a variable, it can match anything. Then there is a class name called total marks. Uh, the student name is a variable, the marks are a variable and the rank is a constant which means it has not been assigned nil is a constant uh, and we are saying that there is no student with marks greater than m. So, that is allowed inside a pattern and who has not been assigned the rank essentially. Then do whatever, the whatever you would do would be you will, is that you would assign the rank to that student. So, negation here is like negation by failure in prolog. So, if you remember negation by failure in prolog says that if you cannot prove this given the knowledge base then it must be false. So, it is not false mean in the sense that you cannot show it to be false. You are saying that this does not of course, in prolog you are talking about influences also in, in rule based uh, languages we are simply saying it does not exist in the knowledge base that there is no record of a student who has got marks more than 79. So, if m is 79 then this is uh, greater than 79 that there is no person who has got more marks. So, therefore, the next rank that you are going to be assigning should be 79. So, obviously, when we write this program we will say that okay, begin with rank 1 and then assign the rank to that student then look for the next highest marks then looks for the next highest mark and the nice thing is this one program will do this whole thing for you. So, we have described part of the rule, we have not described the action part. We will describe the action part a little bit later. Uh, this is just a recap of uh, the rule that is was used in this program called R1, which is also called XCON or expert configurer written by John McDermott. And we have seen this example earlier. But essentially you can see that this is now talking about the left hand side of a rule which says that that is the name of the rule on the top, it is a quite a long name. Uh, so, they must be having many rules and the left hand side says if the current context is assigning devices to a universe module and there is a unassigned dual port disk drive and the TYPE of controller it requires is known and so on and so forth and so you have a whole set of conditions and then you have a set of actions. Those actions are assign the disk drive to so and so and so on. Of course, all that would be encoded in the language ops file. We will come back after a short break and look at the actions that ops file allows you to do.